so it's my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, our second keynote speaker, Dr. Gianmario Benzoni from the University of California at San Diego. Um, Gianmario is also the president of Assisi, uh, and I'll just read out some details from his background. So he, he's um, currently a full research scientist in the Department of Structural Engineering at the University of California, San Diego. He's the director of the Caltrans SRMD testing facility at US UCSD, I'm sure you'll explain what that means, Jim Mario. <laughs> it's a unique test facility for performance characterization of full-scale seismic isolators and energy dissipators. He's editor-in-chief of the oldest European international journal on earthquake engineering. Uh, that's Ingeniera Seismica. And he's uh, the author of more than 200 scientific publications on earthquake engineering research topics, like the seismic behavior of masonry buildings, structural health monitoring, seismic vulnerability and risk evaluation, and experimental tests of um, reinforced concrete bridge components, and the dynamic behavior of seismic isolators and energy dissipators. And the t t title of his presentation, of course, is uh, World Progress on Seismic Isolation and Energy Dissipation in Structures. Now, Jim Mario, of course, uh, knows, knew Nigel Priestley very well, and Nigel attracted him to UCSD to help set up this test facility that Jim Mario runs. And uh, Jim Mario tells me that Nigel and he had a little bet about uh, whether this test facility would actually work and be successful. Now, and uh, Nigel was doubting whether it would be successful, and Jim Mario assured him that it was. So they had a bet. And I don't think you'd bet with Nigel Priestley lightly. Anyway, Jinmaro, you can tell us the outcome of that. Please come and give us your keynote. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, everybody, and um, good morning. Uh, yes, the bet, it's, uh, it's a nice, interesting reference uh, that David uh, brought up. And uh, uh, Nigel that was a great friend. Um, Never said it uh, right, but he thought, well, okay, go and make that machine uh, running, then come back that we, we have research to do together, uh, because the machine will never run. So uh, Nigel, the machine runs, uh, and it runs every day. <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, I'm still stuck with seismic isolation. So anyway, uh, my um, topic today will be exactly seismic isolation, and uh, um, it's I think is the subject uh, and the, is the time time and the place to talk about seismic isolation in series in New Zealand right now. And uh, I would like, because uh, I assume that maybe in the audience there are people that are not uh, very familiar with the technology itself, so to start from the very beginning, uh, slowly. And uh, um, I would uh, start actually from the dictionary and see what isolation means. And I found that this uh, in the dictionary, this definition that perfectly uh, matches uh, uh, our uh, sense of what uh, what we are doing, the sense of what we are doing, so the state of being separated from surrounding environment, uh, mostly motivated by safety or incompatibility reason. That's exactly what we, what we do, and on the left side you can see maybe a little extreme approach of uh, separating the structure from the source of possible problem. Uh, in effect, uh, what we are doing inside seismic isolation could be, in a way, the concept concentrated into this very simple slide where you can see the structure, the conventional structure, be located in a region here of dynamic characteristic that could be prone to be affected by, in terms of, for instance, of high acceleration by the earthquake. And so what we do, this separation, we operate, we operated moving the structure to another uh, range, another range of dynamic characteristic brings, uh, that brings it, for instance, here, where the level of acceleration that the, um, the, the structure will possibly experience uh, is much lower. 
Um, of course, uh, there is a fee to pay in this sense, uh, and the fee is in terms of displacement, uh, so the structure will experience much larger displacement, uh, and those are exactly the, the one that allow us uh, to protect uh, the structure. Now, of course, also, I, um, seismic isolation goes together with energy dissipation. Most uh, seismic isolators uh, already contain at least a little bit of uh, capacity to dissipate energy, otherwise we can provide uh, uh, additional one of supplemental um, dissipation of energy and that uh, allow us to move from one curve down to the other one. So this is the very simple concept and uh, I wanted to start to show, uh, to go back and see in the past. Um, is this a new, um, a new um, intuition? Well, in, um, Plinius is telling us, and Plinius is like a a, a little bit a modern journalist. He uh, could, be, could be involved in fake news, but uh, uh, we believe that um, he was right uh, when he reports about this temple uh, built in 550 before Christ in uh, Asia Minor, it was a temple of Athena. It was actually destroyed by uh, a uh, fire, not by an earthquake, and it was uh, uh, built uh, uh, over a layer of pebble and uh, uh, coal and uh, animal skin. So with the idea, with the intuition that the building will survive uh, moving over, his, uh, over the ground. Um, we can uh, fantasize on the uh, detail that you can find in many, in many other buildings, in many other um, ancient buildings like this uh, tomb of Cyrus uh, II, uh, where the different uh, stones are smoothed for the full surface, even uh, in the region that are covered by the stone on top. And uh, the question is why they went all this way with this uh, tremendous job for that age. So uh, if not, uh, um, considering the possibility or facilitating the possibility of a relative movement between blocks. But this could be a speculation. I think it's definitely not a speculation. Instead, uh, in uh, this type of uh, uh, structure where you can see an obelisk that is seated over four uh, stone cubes, so definitely intended uh, to rock. Um, and uh, even uh, in a rural uh, construction uh, in uh, Iran, if you look at the detail at the bottom, there is uh, definitely no question that here uh, the intuition was there, uh, and not only of movement, but also bidirectional type of movement. Now, proceeding in this uh, history of seismic isolation, uh, I would say that in modern time, uh, um, 1870 is probably uh, the first time when a Frenchman, uh, Touillon, presented a uh, solution of protection of the structure interfacing between foundation and the building with spheres. And uh, interesting enough, just a month after, uh, A.F. Cooper uh, presented a patented, uh, in, uh, the, the same idea, say, of base isolation, but using rubber, uh, called Indian rubber buffers. Um, during the years and in different uh, uh, geographical areas, uh, many ideas have been proposed, uh, layers of log, uh, again, uh, basing uh, with spheres. Uh, to the right, it's an Italian project that, uh, if you consider, is rolling or sliding, uh, kind of similar in geometry already with some modern uh, device that we are going to talk in a moment about. Now, in 1897 and 1967, definitely there, is a, uh, there are patents and, uh, and uh, um, ideas of what is today called the friction pendulum. Uh, the one on the left side is actually a double friction pendulum. Uh, so um, um, I wanted to also mention uh, this interesting character that is a medical doctor uh, um, originally from uh, Armenia um, that was the inventor of many things, um, uh, including uh, the system of uh, seismic isolation based on a layer of uh, 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 sand and mica. And, uh, but it's interesting looking on the right side uh, picture where you can see that he consider also details uh, like uh, um, um, water and uh, gas uh, utilities, uh, but indicating also the type of connections uh, uh, right here that need to allow the displacement. Exactly those type of details that today we pay attention in a seismic isolation application. Um, 
And finally, uh, all this intuition uh, came to fruition in a, uh, two buildings, actually. For the first time in Japan in 1934, uh, the Foucault Bank, um, both uh, uh, built on the concept of isolation uh, by uh, Hawkeye uh, developed in 1928. In, uh, uh, the first European application uh, is the Pestalozzi School in uh, Skopje, in Macedonia. After an earthquake, a Swiss engineer uh, rebuilt uh, the uh, the, the, the school uh, using uh, um, elastomeric bearings uh, that were, however, very soft vertically, and so they were finally replaced in 2007 by high damping rubber bearing, and you can see also the bridge that was mentioned yesterday also in a presentation, the first bridge in Europe, um, instrumented and protected by linear devices. This was done by, uh, on a project of Dr. Mederot that is here in the room today. Uh, of course, New Zealand wrote an important uh, chapter in seismic isolation, uh, not only but mainly through the figure of uh, uh, Bill Robinson, uh, with his invention of the lead rubber bearing and the first application in, uh, right here in Wellington in the William uh, Clayton building. Uh, I didn't know that the building has been uh, modified, so it doesn't have the shape anymore that you see on the right, but it's still here. Uh, now, so my question is, uh, um, is this a new technology? Well, it's always a new technology because we're using uh, new devices, new material, new production methods, a new field of application. But I would like to focus my presentation today on the need of an integrated uh, design vision. And uh, so while uh, the intuition is probably coming from the past and not uh, definitely new, uh, the way we process the design uh, should be new. And uh, um, to do this, I wanted to start it from uh, this interesting slide that was presented by the curator of the uh, Museum uh, uh, of Modern Art in uh, New York that is actually talking about design in another sense, the design of uh, a chair, of a vase, or uh, a object uh, of daily use, uh, things that can go in a museum. But he applies uh, um, incredibly also to our concept, or he should apply to our concept of design. And you can see on the left side, the, the old concept of design and what should be the new concept of design. So if we go through the first few lines, and you can agree with all of them or some of them, but uh, the, the new type of design should be critical other than affirmative. It should be problem finding other than problem solving. Uh, it should be design as a medium, not a design as a process. And in particular, I like down the road here, uh, research for design as an old approach versus a research through design, or uh, as an uh, educator, uh, training versus education. So starting from this vision and uh, this approach that should be critical, I think we should, uh, uh, it's probably time uh, to uh, point out to uh, area where uh, we could have uh, uh, space for improvement uh, and be honest about them. And uh, here I'll maybe be criticized, but I want to show you what I experience as one of the critical aspects of the implementation of this technology. Now, particularly uh, I'm addressing to young engineers that want to approach it for the first time. The designer usually at the first approach tend to consider himself uh, non-expert on seismic isolation. And so um, what he does, uh, he, of course, uh, he refers uh, to the device manufacturers that have been involved in many applications around the world, so it's an expert by definition. Now what happened is actually here, as an Italian I yet to use this picture, um, you can see what happened, okay? You have the manufacturer on the side, the designer on the other one, and sure, they are close but not touching. Um, it's understandable, uh, they have different goals, uh, if you want, um, but uh, this tells me that the designer should be uh, the promoter of the whole uh, integration of the process. He doesn't have to um, um, deflect his responsibility uh, to other entities like the manufacturer or even worse, to the code that is usually what uh, puts together and covers this gap. Uh, paraphrasing what was said in, uh, in the past, I would like to avoid uh, that the code is like uh, uh, ivy for architects or mayonnaise for uh, chefs cover our mistakes. So um, let's see what uh, the code says, and here I 
took one example, uh, ASC 716 in its draft format, but again, uh, there is nothing specifically about the ASC because uh, the same uh, concept, the uh, reasoning that I, we go through, uh, could be applied to uh, the Euro code. Um, no, um, regular uh, codes right now tend to introduce this concept of property modification factor, maybe not called the property modification factor, but uh, saying um, multiplier factors that are used used to um, define limits, minimum and maximum, to bound the design parameter uh, for uh, the seismic isolation system. And this allows the designer to try and to stay in between a minimum and a maximum and do his own analysis. And those uh, parameters should be um, comprehensive uh, com uh, altogether of all uh, the possible sources of variability of the, of the performance parameter of the of the devices. Uh, of course, uh, uh, you understand that, that the focus on the devices here is, uh, is, uh, is uh, paramount because uh, all uh, the, the, the resources, if you want, the nonlinear uh, uh, performance and all uh, the, 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 the anti-seismic uh, um, uh, performance of the structure is associated to the devices. Now, um, so those, uh, um, those uh, property modification factors can take in, in, into account all those sources of variability that you see on the left right now. And so I said, well, let's try a little example to prove my point that is coming uh, slowly, but uh, it will come. So uh, let's take a little uh, structure, five-story concrete frame, and we imagine that this, uh, this structure is uh, um, isolated over a friction pendulum isolator. You don't need to know what they are in details. Actually, that's kind of proved my point. You could be a designer that does, is not an expert, okay? But the code kind of takes you by hand and uh, step by step. It's interesting, the, 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 the comment that uh, Dr. Lagos made yesterday, that there should be uh, a moment of thinking, a moment of decision, and then uh, the implementation through the code. But uh, I must say that the code of seismic isolation tend to be uh, more aggressive. They, they try to uh, come at you in the first stage um, because they want to drive you through the process, really step by step. So, Let's apply this code and we take, for instance, three different uh, uh, input like Loma Prieta, Kobe, Erzican, and uh, we do uh, what the uh, sorry we do what the the code requires. That is, uh, we run a very simple analysis uh, to identify uh, peak displacement, peak forces, and period that will be used in the next phase of. Uh, uh, of the design that the code uh, uh, already uh, prepared for me. So uh, we ran this analysis. We need a three different level of load, an average, a maximum, and a minimum. And I can use uh, a sub-2000, a state-of-the-practice uh, uh, model where there is uh, this uh, uh, nonlinear friction isolator link. So I, and, uh, I based on the fact that I'm using uh, uh, friction-based uh, uh, devices, I'm supposed to uh, select a nominal friction coefficient, let's say for instance in this example 8%, and apply those multiplier, a minimum and maximum that is 2.1 and 0.6. So um, at this point I can run my analysis, my very preliminary analysis, and define uh, the peak displacement effective period that I will use in the next phase. So I'm identifying here in bold, you can see the uh, maximum due to this lower bound of the friction coefficient, but already interesting the fact that a maximum is also not necessarily related to the lower bound of the, of the friction parameter, but also to the upper, upper bound, possibly depending on the shape of the input. So having those numbers, uh, the code tells me, OK, now you take two prototypes, you go to the laboratory, and you perform exactly those tests. OK? Um, so uh, those are actually. Uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine tests. Uh, Eurocode, for instance, for, for devices of this nature, it's even more uh, uh, extensive. It's about 14 tests. So it's a lot of testing. And uh, please uh, um, just to read uh, this uh, statement down here at the bottom that says dynamic tests are not required if already being performed on similar isolator. And let's put it on a side for a moment. I'll be back to that uh, in a second. So I have to perform this test.
test, so that's okay. But also the code tells me, okay, based on the result of those tests, those are the acceptance uh, criteria. So the acceptance criteria are based on uh, effective stiffness, uh, restoring stiffness, energy dissipated per cycle. So if, uh, looking at the um, nominal performance of the device, essentially they are based on the slope, on the effective stiffness of the area of the of the cycle. So uh, we do that. Uh, we perform the test in our little example. We perform the test. Uh, we come back. We plug the number in. Uh, we calculate the KD, K effective, and so on. And you will see in red here figures uh, that says that uh, my device is rejected. Is not in the range of the lambda acceptable uh, acceptable range boundary. So is rejected. And so. Um, it's not interesting per se, this example, uh, but it's just uh, a mechanism for me uh, to uh, present you uh, this question. So now, what am I supposed to do? Where am I wrong? Is my structure, is the ch selection of the devices, is uh, what it is? So, and here is uh, the point uh, where I think uh, is a, uh, the, the, the designer have a, a serious difficulty because it is difficult to translate the experimental results into his design, so into uh, his nominal design parameter and the reliable modification factor. So what has been done in the laboratory is not translated easily into his way of thinking as a designer. But why that? Well, let's take, for instance, one requirement very, very quickly. Requirement number three uh, tells uh, that you have to verify the consist uh, consistency of the effective stiffness. But Actually, the effective stiffness is not directly representative of the variability uh, of any individual physical parameter of this isolator. The variability of the coefficient of friction has a minor effect on the effective stiffness. So you don't have this tool of translating the experimental uh, information into your design because uh, those parameters are unrelated. So um, another example, if you want, take a uh, test number four. I suppose to run a 10 cycle and uh, check the energy dissipated per cycle. But if you consider here, for instance, a variable, any variable uh, that you can imagine that is a representative of the heat generated during those 10 cycles, you can see that the test four and the actual earthquake the three earthquakes that we, that we consider in our little example, there is a big gap, there is a big disagreement. So I would tend to say that test four is not representative of the thermodynamic phenomena associated with seismic event. And so it can be extremely penalizing, and in any case, at least not providing you a valuable information. So, what do we need? I think we need consistency at this stage. We need uh, design models and procedure together with a set of uh, criteria, testing requirement that uh, links together. Links together based on what uh, specific information the test is supposed to provide. And I would say mostly the last line here, how can the information be simply used for the design of isolated structure? Well, let me give you an example, I think we should start from the laboratory. This is the famous uh, Nigel machine, let's call it. <laughs> the machine that Nigel didn't believe in it. <laughs> okay, this is in the laboratory in San Diego that we have been using for the last uh, 17 years to test a full scale uh, seismic isolator and the energy dissipator. But you don't have to start from my lab, you can start from any lab, but essentially from what the experiment are telling you about uh, the performance. And sometimes, you know, interesting uh, things happen uh, even from very important manufacturer and uh, those are excellent moments of progress in my opinion. Um, now let's continue with this idea of the friction pendulum. Uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, obsessed with the friction pendulum. I just picked up those uh, as an example, but uh, they're actually the cool, uh, the cool guys at the moment in seismic isolation. And uh, for, for good reason, I would say. Uh, I, um, right here is a, is a single pendulum. Here is a double pendulum, triple pendulum, and I guess it progresses uh, to multiple pendulum. But um, here is a, is a problem uh, that when you go to the laboratory and you see how the, the device performed, uh, you immediately realize that somewhere in the process that there was an oversimplification approach to 
transfer the information about the performance of those devices. Uh, unfortunately, in my personal opinion, the simplification is very desirable, but it should come at the very end of an understanding process, not at the beginning, not presented, uh, uh, neglecting uh, physical phenomena that are actually happening. So, for instance, uh, the performance of that device has always been presented uh, made of two components, a restoring components and a frictional components. Um, and uh, if you look, uh, for instance, at the slope uh, that determine the restoring components, uh, this is the weight uh, divided by the radius of curvature. Now, what radius of curvature? If you read the early paper, they don't say what radius of curvature. So people can tend to use this one. This is the top part, and the, this is the bottom part of the device. Uh, this, uh, this radius of curvature, but geometrically it's not. The pendulum performs uh, with a radius of curvature that is this uh, segment plus this. So it's an R effective. Now, given the current geometry of devices, this can introduce already 8 or 10% error that we don't need. It's so simple to do the right thing, but we need to be informed about. So, um, and so on for many other parameters that are exact expression and simplified expression. Now, if we go back to this restoring component, uh, you can overlap uh, this W over R effective over uh, uh, experimental data, and you will have a pretty good match. Not exact, uh, again, because there is another possibility of uh, variation that is not uh, uh, accounted for, that is the development right here of uh, uh, some friction. The sliding material is applied down here and also up here. So when the slider, so this uh, curve portion, goes up and down, the bearing, of course, uh, it needs to rotate into the top cap. So developing a moment that determines that this reaction is not actually centered, as it was mentioned in the very early paper, but is uh, shifted. So like the slider is moving over curvature that is uh, steeper. Uh, going up uh, up the side. So that means that you have a different restoring uh, force. And this usually could be in the order maximum of another 10% uh, error. Um, now, the direction of this vector, while this is well known, it goes back to the center of the, of the device. Now, let's see the friction component. It is, uh, in my opinion, a little more critical. First, what's the direction of this force? Well, this force is not the same. It, has, it doesn't have the same direction of the velocity vector, like you can find in literature everywhere. Um, this is not visible if you run monodirectional tests, but if you run a bidirectional tests that are actually three-dimensional di because the, free, the, the pendulum goes up and down, um, you immediately see that because the slider will tend to rotate. Essentially, a uh, disalignment is generated from forces at the top and at the bottom of the slider that generates a rotation, very visible, for instance, for triple pendulum. And uh, uh, even if you, if you plot this phase angle versus time, uh, there, is a, there is a disagreement. Uh, there is an, an angular shift uh, that is usually, again, uh, for the most current uh, geometry in the order of 14%. So now we know the way we can orient this vector, but the most important part is, uh, um, is uh, the, um, the amplitude. Uh, we know that the coefficient of friction, or better, the frictional characteristics, uh, are affected by load effect, uh, cycling effect, velocity effect, breakaway effect. Uh, definitely experimentally verified cyclic effect, uh, where I mean with cycling effect, uh, the, uh, the, the, the accumulation of travel, of movement, uh, uh, that creates uh, a, a thermal situation, an increase of temperature at the sliding interface, uh, so changing the coefficient of friction. The, uh, the cycling effect is definitely the prevalent, and uh, I can show you that in a motion, for instance, uh, of 30 seconds, uh, with different level of pressure, uh, 15 megapascal on the left and 60 on the other one, you can have a variation of coefficient of friction of 32%, 34% uh, right here, and uh, all the way up to 56% down here, just due to this uh, cycling effect. So it's not negligible. And uh, 
Um, the fact uh, that, uh, for instance, the breakaway uh, effect instead uh, apparently is less uh, visible in a bidirectional test than monodirectional test because uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in bidirectional test the bearing is always a little moving. Instead, in monodirectional, it goes there, theoretically stops, it comes back, and so on. So this breakaway is more significant. And if you consider multidirectional test in general, um, you have also two additional effects that are minor, but uh, for the sake of, uh, uh, um, of, of clarity, let's, uh, let's mention them. Uh, there is also this asymmetric effect because the, the, the surface are machine with certain directions, so the coefficient of friction is not the same in every direction. Friction, it's a little touchy character to, to deal with. Now, all this effect can be, put in, can be taken into account in a model. Now, um, please be assured that I'm not pushing you this model. I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, uh, I, I don't want you to complicate your design process. Actually, it's, it's the opposite. But if you want, they exist. Uh, this is a model we developed by UCSD, but there are other ones, where essentially we indicated as sources, main sources of variation of the coefficient of friction, uh, a, a function of the vertical load, a function of that cycling, uh, repetition of cycle, and uh, of velocity. Now, why uh, I'm mentioning this? Because this, in my opinion, a phenomenological model, model verified in the laboratory, could be your uh, lens, could be your um, approach to get to look deeper into this need of coordination. Uh, what I mean? Well, I mean that. Um, if you uh, accept uh, a, a model that, that consider the major phenomenon that are happening in the lab, uh, well, then you can revisit the requirement, uh, for instance, uh, of testing, of a testing protocol. Let's do an example. We want to uh, apply into our design uh, the uh, effect due to the vertical load. So I go to the lab and I run a very simple test, a test where I move the, 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 the bearing all the way to the peak displacement and back to zero. That's it, very slowly. Uh, so I'm trying to separate and to eliminate the effect of velocity. Uh, I don't do a crazy motion uh, introducing a thermal effect, but I just do a simple test, slow, at the different vertical load so I can have a variation not exactly function only of the vertical load but essentially uh, providing me a very specific information that I can use in my design. Mm, the other example, velocity effect, well I'll do a type of uh, motion of this nature, again uh, not too much, not to, to introduce thermal effect, vertical load limited, uh, maybe 10% of the average load and that will indicate uh, if I reach a plateau uh, the variation function of velocity. Uh, you want the cyclic effect, that is the major one. Well, we need to maintain a vertical load, a velocity constant, so constant vertical load, a triangular uh, type of motion, and that will give you uh, the sense of the variation uh, with the thermal effect. And those are uh, information that you can directly apply into your modeling. Still uh, creating those boundaries that many codes uh, uh, suggest to do, or if you want to be more sophisticated, you can directly implement uh, the uh, model into your finite element uh, uh, analysis. And the model can be calibrated with few tests in the laboratory. So it's important that, that uh, you don't uh, buy into the objection that is, oh, those are just academic uh, terms, okay? The, uh, actually, the performance is simpler than that. Again, be careful, the oversimplification. Now, if you try to uh, consider a model and, uh, and see the variation of energy dissipated per cycle, um, here the dots are experiment. Uh, those are different pressure. The dots are experimental data. I want just to point out the difference between the solid curve and the dots. The solid curve is the one that does not consider uh, the thermal effect, uh, the variation coefficient of friction with temperature developed during the motion. So in this case, uh, you will expect uh, a performance and availability of energy uh, um, dissipation capacity that you don't have. So you could have a displacement uh, that is higher than what you expect in your analysis. So 
Um, again, now I want to get back uh, that, um, that uh, um, little statement that we said, uh, dynamic tests are not required if already been performed on similar isolator. Well, I would say pay attention to this. Behind this, there is the attempt to pre-qualify devices. I'm, a I'm very skeptical about that, I must be honest. And uh, I start from uh, the opinion of Professor Salomon here that says that the coefficient of friction is just a convenience, it doesn't exist. Uh, well, we see that every day. People coming to test uh, uh, friction-based devices uh, with uh, the absolute certainty that the friction is 6% uh, because they tested on a little machine, sorry, on a little machine, and then they say, oh, but it's the material is the same. So the friction coefficient moves with the material, it's the same, it's the same batch, and so on, and the friction is completely different. So uh, the friction coefficient is not a parameter of the, uh, uh, it's not related to the material, it's not a characteristic of the material, of the system. So uh, be careful with this uh, sense of also definition of what is similar in isolators. Anyway. So I think that uh, I, I hope, I transfer to you, you the idea that we need uh, a logic and a coordinated uh, process that, uh, where the code is at the center, is, uh, it provides all the information but with a goal of being able uh, to transfer information from the laboratory directly into our um, design. And now you also realize that those devices are traveling the world so they could be qualified and certified in Romania and be applied in South Korea. And there is no problem with that, but we should, I believe, uh, work on an international code on seismic isolation that guarantee a, a consistency of characterization, certification of devices, acceptance criteria, qualification of the testing laboratory, design procedure and implementation of experimental results into design, and so on. And uh, I would throw this uh, challenge uh, to the New Zealand friend uh, that are working on the most recent uh, seismic isolation code. Why not think uh, of this possibility to put a seed like it has been done in New Zealand uh, in structural engineering many times uh, that will grow in a, uh, in a much wider um, um, knowledge uh, around the world. So start from whatever you're doing that I personally don't know, but uh, with new ideas uh, independently and uh, think those as a possibility to go, to use a bad word that is common, uh, to go viral, okay? Uh, now, um, I would uh, uh, finish with few slides um, that are uh, um, what, uh, uh, from the, the laboratory perspective, we see as a very hot topic. One studies about a vertical component of motion. This is motivated by a lot of research that is happening on the nuclear power plan. Um, and uh, here I listed uh, uh, two very early uh, applications and two more recent applications, I think almost complete in Cadarache in France, but I guarantee there are a lot of activity and a lot of testing on uh, extreme devices uh, that will be used in design in, uh, in uh, USA, Korea, Europe, uh, Japan, and so on. So, um, and the uh, uh, concept of vertical isolation it's still a, a, an important uh, subject of uh, uh, discussion. Um, I think it's extremely important uh, the uh, question of durability of those devices. What's the lifespan of those devices? If you ask a manufacturer, uh, so what, uh, how long do you guarantee your devices that the answer is gonna be what? Um, so, second, so how long do you guarantee? And then the numbers go ballistic from five uh, years to, to infinity. Um, essentially, for some device, we don't know anything about uh, the durability of those materials. So, this field de deserves research um, and a collection of data. But we know a lot about elastomeric bearing. Uh, elastomeric bearing are actually uh, being removed from service in some case right here uh, from Australia and an analysis was done 100 years after uh, indicating just a small degradation confined to the surface region. Uh, there are 20-year-old uh, natural rubber from UK uh, where the measured value of compression and shear stiffness were still in the tolerance uh, uh, range uh, and uh, 38 years uh, um, uh, as well. So uh, we know for the rubber bearing because are the oldest uh, applied that uh, durability is, uh, is 
sort of um, solid and guarantee uh, for other material we don't know or better we know about uh, the single material that represent the constitute a, a, a single device uh, but not as a device itself here you see some uh, uh, an example of a forensic analysis done on a uh, viscous damper um, the topic of protection of cultural heritage in, in Europe uh, is very, is very uh, active. Uh, we go from a protection of the uh, Pietà Rondanini in Milano all the way to uh, a system to protect a structure that, for instance, by Italian code cannot be touched, not in elevation, not even in the foundation. So you have to protect the structure without touching it. It's quite challenging. So this, uh, um, this uh, uh, solution actually is proposed by Paolo Clemente that uh, mentioned it uh, yesterday, um, or maybe even today. Um, monitoring of seismic isolated structure, monitoring, it's important, I would say mostly for bridges, because it provides those data, and uh, it's possible today to have uh, a status of the uh, progression and the performance of the single device uh, with instruments uh, without uh, too much sophistication installed on a bridge. Um, again, the use of innovative material and uh, uh, configuration. Um, there are researchers working on uh, uh, 3D manufacture uh, material that are very promising to be used in seismic isolation. This penta mode, the performance essentially depends only on the geometry. And uh, I think that um, I will close here thinking that those uh, uh, future uh, uh, approaches and future uh, uh, research uh, will provide as uh, something uh, maybe not creative as uh, the solution, but uh, certainly safer. And uh, I thank you for your attention. Right time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Jim Mario. There's plenty of time for questions. Uh, so I hope um, the audience ha has some. Uh, maybe I'll just start by saying, Jim Mario, do you recommend 100% testing of all production uh, devices? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I knew that this was coming. Um, well, I, I have to go against my interest. Of course, I say, as a laboratory manager, I say absolutely, 100%, uh, all of them, maybe twice. Uh, but uh, uh, no, it's not the case. Uh, I definitely share the vision, actually, of Bill Robinson. We had many conversations about that, that the number of tests should be dramatically reduced. But I would say that uh, the production, I mean, the, the two things should not be, uh, should not be um, detached, uh, what you do as a prototype and what you do as a production. If you do the good job as a prototype, uh, that job will uh, uh, reduce dramatically the amount uh, of tests that you have to do a production. Now, uh, production, something should be done for quality control. Um, and uh, uh, in Eurocode, for instance, there is a severe penalty that uh, if something failed during the production, very rapidly you go to have the need to test 100% of the devices. That could be relaxed, I think. It can happen. Uh, but uh, um, already, I'm saying uh, my personal opinion is that uh, from the prototype testing, you will have an idea of uh, uh, consistency uh, of the both of the manufacturing process and the performance of devices so you should not have uh, the need uh, of a gigantic production testing other questions or comments please You're very quiet well if there's no questions I'll uh, I'll close and thank Jim Mario very much for his presentation thank you It's a, a little gift of some New Zealand art. Thank you. Thank you.